All right, good, e good evening. Yeah, good. And welcome to Colonial Williamsburg's Heneage Auditorium. I'm Cliff Fleet, the president and CEO of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. It is wonderful to have all of you here with us this evening. Um, I thought I'd give a couple of remarks before we uh, introduce our plenary for this evening. Uh, the book I'm reading right now is actually written by Gordon Wood, and it's called Friends Divided. I don't know if anybody's read this book. I see a few nods around the thing. Uh, I, th I find it to be a very helpful book to read uh, in times when it seems like there's divides that cannot be overcome. Uh, because in reading this book, you recognize that political division and discourse and disagreement um, is much a part of the American character as anything else. We've been actually doing this from our very beginnings. Um, and disagreements about what's in the newspaper, if you read this book carefully, are actually very true also. Jefferson quoted, and I paraphrase, if it's printed in the newspaper, it takes a truth and makes it into a lie. <laughs> um, I use that as a framework to remind ourselves that the lessons of today you know, can be framed and shaped and understood by the lessons of the past. And also it asks and begs us the question about what unites us as Americans. Because as we all know, we're not united by ethnicity or religion or a king. What really unites us, if you read deeply into our history and you look at the sentiments of today, and I believe this to be very true because it is an indelible part of the American character, American character. What unites us as a people is a belief in freedom and the belief that people should be free. The challenge with that, of course, is that we have never been very good at doing that and doing it in a way that is equal for all people. We certainly didn't have it right at our inception. When you look at the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, while they are terribly significant documents and inspired freedom movements all over the world, they were also terribly and tragically incomplete. And our nation has been on a journey to figure out what does freedom mean and how do we make it equal. And how do we bring it in equal benefits to all and do it a way that all have equal protection? That's why I think this topic that you're all discussing is so important. Because as we think about what does freedom mean to more marginalized populations, we have to think deeply about how do we uncover the history of those populations and make sure that we bring those voices to the forefront so that it's not just the perspective of my white ancestors that bears to bail on that, but it's also African voices and native voices and other voices in terms of what does it mean to be free in America? And what does that mean for how we need to think about how we construct our work today as a society in terms of what we do and how we do it? Before I turn it over though, I do want to give um, a nod of acknowledgement, and I don't think she's here, to Dr. Karen Wolf. Uh, when many of you may or may not know that William & Mary in Colonia Williamsburg uh, founded the Omahundra Institute a very long time ago. Somebody here knows exactly the date. I wish I did. It escapes me a moment. <laughs> 1943, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and it founded it to make Williamsburg an intellectual center for the study of early American history. And I believe that it has grown into that over time. And so it is terribly important that we do work that advances knowledge and understanding and academic endeavors. And this conference is part of that. And so we're very blessed to have all of you with us.
today and hopefully next year and the year after as we advance this. Because what Karen envisioned, and she and I discussed this very early several years ago, is that we wanted to do conferences that focused on our nation as we approached our anniversary in 2026. And we wanted to do five of them to make sure that we told a more full and complete and truthful story about our nation's history. And you all play a critically important role in making sure that that happens. So thank you very much for your contributions to enable us to do that. So, With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mary Ruth Letfitch, who's the Senior Director of Museum Operations and Education at, I had to get that right, <laughs> um, uh, at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, which is a magnificent uh, sister or brother, I'm not sure what the gender of a museum is, <laughs> institution that we work extraordinarily close with in this area. Uh, to advance our understanding of our nation's origins, and she will invite the panelists up for this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. And welcome, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here this afternoon. Again, my name is Mary Ruth Leftwich. I'm with the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. So we operate Jamestown Settlement and the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown and spaces that we are thinking quite a lot about what it means to restore indigenous voice. Um, and we have a wonderful panel. They are going to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their work and how this centers. So this is the question for you all. Um, as you introduce yourself, if you can share a little bit about how your work centers and connects with the theme of restoring indigenous voice in museums of early America. So Fallon, you want to take it away? Sure. Uh... And we have Wingapo and Quay. I'm Fallon Berner. I'm the Indigenous Historian and Program Design Manager here at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, I'm also one of the three managers of the American Indian Initiative, which is what houses basically the Indigenous Interpretive Unit here. Um, but we also, in our redesign of what the initiative is that happened this year, um, we're going to be rolling research um, and community engagement into that, and so that it's all kind of one, um, you know, central hub for trying to really re-indigenize this space that has colonial in its title. Um, because as as you know, a native community member here trying to go out and recruit other native people to want to work here is hard. When I say that the museum I work at is called Colonial Williamsburg, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, they did not have this push. <laughs> Those. James Townses. We were just talking about how we, we get conflated often even by uh, Virginians who have lived here their whole lives still think that all three of our museums are um, under the same umbrella and are run by the same entity when they're three completely different things, state, federal, and private funding. <laughs> we literally have nothing to do with um, each other's structures other than collegiality. Um, so a little over a year ago, my position did not exist. I just started working here. They had not had an indigenous historian before. I mean, they, they had identified the need for that um, a while ago, but it takes a little bit to get funding and get things um, supported and in there. So yeah, I was gonna actually start referencing some slides. Yeah, so this is actually our current team um, and it has fluctuated over the years. Um, I think the highest watermark we've ever had of uh, native interpreters here was five or six. Um, but right now, um, this year we actually went down to zero. <laughs> and myself and Christopher Custlow, who's one of the other managers, um, have worked so hard to recruit um, from the local community and from beyond. Um, and now we have two full-time interpreters. We just hired a third one and uh, they'll be starting at the end of next month. Um, and we've got an intern, uh, and we still have some more positions open. So if you know any Native people who would like to work here, I've got an internship and another full-time position. Um, so behind me is, is mostly our current team. There's some people who have just recently this year moved on to other jobs with tribes and other universities. Um, and so just a kind of glimpse of some of the things that we do. We have an encampment site here um, that's our permanent sort of everyday site that we interpret. Um, and the encampment tents have to do with the narrative of the foreign tribes here. We also interpret what we call the tributary tribes, which would be our local um, Virginia tribes. So. Um, Basically, our, our position in the community here is to try to really help tell the Virginia indigenous narrative in the 18th century, because that's a huge gap in the scholarship um, that we're trying to help fill um, and to partner with the local Virginia communities because we're on their land. 
our museum is on their land. And actually, I guess uh, we should have done some kind of land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that ancestrally in the 17th century, this would have been the joint you know, territory between the Paspahe and Kiskiak tribes, um, who by the end of the 17th century, we don't see a presence of. And so today, our site, uh, Williamsburg itself, which was joint hunting ground for many tribes and would have been sort of an agreed upon um, use of hunting space is still important to all of the 11 state recognized tribes within Virginia today. And so we honor that we have that relationship and those responsibilities. Um, but as Colonial Williamsburg, we interpret 50 modern tribes. 50. Because that's how many modern tribes today, after diaspora and removals and things, after tribes have fractured and what one tribe was is now four tribes, for example, that's how that number got that big. Um, that's, that's how many tribes came through here and had business with the governor in Williamsburg in the 18th century. I think I had anything else to tell you right now. I think these are all, oh yeah, and so we've done some initiatives recently um, to kind of modernize, like get our staff in touch with the modern community. Um, we've been honoring, we honored Orange Shirt Day this year, um, which has to do with the boarding and residential schools narrative, and our staff was very supportive of getting on board and doing that with us. And this is just to show that we've had um, a lot of interpretation in the past where we've even recruited other folks who are not our regular full-time interpreters to come in and work with us on a part-time basis or for, for special events so that we can tell a more full and complete story about all of the business that Native people came here to do with the English crown. And all of these are just for funsies for later. Slides for later. You get a preview. Thank you, Fallon. Russell. Well, good afternoon, uh, Yiltel. Uh, my name is Russell Reed. I'm a community member with the Atakba Ishak tribe of Louisiana. Um, I am a soldier in the Army National Guard, but my main job and function is the acting site supervisor at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, specifically for the Paspahay Town, which I'm not sure how many of y'all are really familiar with living history in the eastern half of this country, but there are not that many living history sites in the first place, and there are next to no indigenous living history sites. The handful that exist, um, which sadly is a dwindling number, are sometimes run by the tribes themselves, uh, which is great for the tribes to have sort of the control of their own story, which has oftentimes not been the case. Um, but ours is one that is uh, through the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, uh, partially run by the state, and the Paspahe town that we represent is not attributed directly to one of the Virginia tribes that exists today, uh, which creates a unique opportunity that all of the Virginia tribes or people from other tribes in the Eastern Woodlands um, can be involved in the story. It doesn't belong to just one tribe or another, um, but it is one of the only indigenous living history sites on the entire Eastern half of the country. Um, so definitely an important site um, and really, uh, the pictures that I have here, which we can go through a little bit more of later, um, are kind of some of the work that we do. Um, so this is just an image of us uh, at Harbor Fest this past year, uh, interpreting sort of indigenous uses of the waterways, uh, indigenous craft as far as dugout canoes and all that kind of things. Sort of taking the work that we do uh, in the Paspahay Town site and sort of going out into the community, not just working with the people that we see who actually come through the museum. Um, this is me and a friend of mine who were invited, um, us sort of specifically by the Nanceman tribe of Virginia, um, to their powwow a year or two ago to teach traditional culture. Um, as it's me giving a demonstration for a bunch of people at the museum, this is just the kind of bare bones um, sort of idea of our site for any of you all who have not um, been to Jamestown uh, settlement and sort of seen the Paspahay town. Um, yeah, and then these images, which we'll go through a little bit more later when they come up, are actually from the original opening uh, around that period of the Jamestown settlement around 1957. And the people representing the more broad Powhatan chiefdom at this point, uh, these are actually Rappahannock tribal members. Um, so the original interpreters uh, for what became our Paspahay town site today were um, members of the Virginia tribes, although that has come and gone and waxed and waned over the years. Uh, but that's kind of the basics of uh, what I do, and uh, go ahead and pass it on. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Russell. Um, Dave. Yeah, uh, my name is Dave Givens. I'm the director of archaeology at Jamestown. 
and uh, grew up in the mountains on a farm in Blacksburg, Virginia. And um, while walking to the bus one day, I looked over in our Cimarron alfalfa field and saw a quartz spear point. And I picked it up and was marveling at it and stuck it in my pocket and went to uh, high school. And my uh, history teacher, Miss Grapsis from Boston, I said to Miss Grapsis, who made this? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, where did the people go that made this? And she said, I don't know. And I said, how come we don't know? And <laughs> she said, look, kid, there's these archaeologists that meet at the library, the public library. And it was the Archaeology Society of Virginia. And I was 14 years old, and you know these guys were happy to have somebody, some young guy to screen for them. And, but I got, I got pulled into a world of a, a diff, sort of a different kind of archaeology that we're doing at Jamestown. And it, it, archaeology is kind of like a, a sickness that you get. <laughs> and so I ended up getting, you know, going off to college, essentially, to Virginia Commonwealth University. And I started going by the archaeology lab that wasn't on the way home from class. And I studied a bunch of different things, and, and um, Dr. Dan Maurer, who was, was one of my you know, foundational sort of narratives in my life, he, he said, first day of class, look, if you want a BMW by the time you're 30, go down the hall to the you know, engineering or whatever. And so that was our you know, first thing. To, and so I decided to spread the chips out. So I studied four years of Russian, computer science, all this stuff, and I ended up in 1992, finding myself in the former Soviet Republic studying privatization at the Russian Academy of Sciences. You know, spoke Russian actually quite well, but you're displaced, right? You're outside your element, and uh, very good for a young person. And then I returned in 1992, and it was a recession. And my roommate from college, uh, Dane Magoon, hopefully soon to be Dr. Dane Magoon, um, called me and he said, hey, there, there's a site and we're working out here, you ought to come down. And it was the Paspahe Village um, at Governor's Land, which is the 18th fairway of a golf course now, <laughs> and um, which and many uh, First Peoples sites late, late in the 16th and 17th century are now golf courses or factories and things like that. And so I came down and, and just didn't leave. And then when the James Henry Discovery Project started. We, I was working for Nick Lucchetti and Bly Straub and sort of matriculated into the team there. Um, I think that that life experience, when I explain that to people, that's why we sort of look at Jamestown in a little bit different sense. It's myself, d uh, director of archaeology, and uh, Jamie May, the director of museums, and Michael Labin. And so under the direction of Dr. Horn, we're we're sort of given the ability to, to look at things maybe in a different perspective than, than a classic sense. And Jamestown is uh, truly an event horizon, right? And so I struggle with this myself personally. I don't like using the word prehistory because that robs people of that they don't have history, right? Which is absolutely not the case. There's 15,000 years of uh, First Peoples, you know, influences in our, in our our nation, and so we, um, we, we think about the landscape a little bit differently now, and I think that's what we'll, we'll talk about today, mm -hmm. or tonight. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Sean. Yeah, I'm going to give a quick skip through all skip your slides. I'm going to uh, look at all these great sites I worked on. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll come back to them. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so my name is Sean Devlin. I'm the uh, senior curator of archaeology of the archaeological collection here at the Connie Williamsburg Foundation. Um, and I guess maybe since we are kind of sort of telling personal stories to some degree, right? I'll I'll be blunt. I am not an expert in Native American material culture or Native histories, right? Um, I, I'm an archaeologist. I, I sort of uh, most of my career has been spent looking at um, sort of colonial periods, but but certainly later in the 18th century and 19th century. I think there's a reason why I ended up here, right? Um, but I do think that right sort of in my recent past, uh, uh, I'll name another organization uh, that I used to work for, uh, Mount Vernon. And um, it's really when I came to be the curator of collections there that I really sort of the importance of uh, the sort of indigenous story at these historic sites really became apparent to me, right? Um, uh, uh, sort of, and, and the intertwined nature of, of some of the stories that we need to tell at, at sites um, 
uh, associated with sort of these figures in American history. Uh, so at Mount Vernon, there's a, a, a cemetery where most of the enslaved population from the plantation is actually buried on the property. Uh, that cemetery uh, is also the site of a, 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 a indigenous site from the late archaic, so part of this deep history narrative, right, about how land at Mount Vernon was used and how, how land in this country was used and, and who was here, right? Um, and, and sort of that juxtaposition about the stories that needed to be told coming from archaeological work that was meant to sort of document that, that site um, uh, to, to sort of you know, preserve in, in efforts for preservation and things like that really sort of struck me as this is an area that I think we really need to emphasize or, or struck, brought home for me personally uh, how we need to sort of talk about that at, at uh, sites that we traditionally classify as historic area or, or later period sites, right? Um, so fast forward a little bit to coming here, um, and I think maybe I can kind of, <clears throat> uh, at some point tonight I might play, uh, uh, I, I may not speak just for myself, right, because Colonial Williamsburg has 100 years of archaeology that's taken place here, and um, our relationship with, you know, empowering indigenous stories here has had a very complicated mm -hmm. history, and it's had its waning and waxing, right? Um, uh, and uh, so I think sort of where uh, I, I would uh, probably sort of say, um, you know, we have an entire team of archeology span now that is really sort of attempting to uh, step away from some of our interpretations in the past that, that really did sort of minimize the presence of um, native artifacts in the excavations that took place here in town, right? Uh, certainly for at least the first 80 years of our, of our work despite having excavated sites that are inherently of 17th century, some of the most important sites, some of the most important uh, uh, places that are associated with these, these stories of colonialism, uh, we really had a continual focus on the English side of the story, right? To the point that we actually, in our reports, might talk about you know, the, the artifacts that are definitively associated with native communities in a sentence or two. Um, and so I think what we're, we're trying to do at this moment and may, uh, I don't want to sort of go on and on about a particular site or anything, but we had a really sort of groundbreaking moment as a department. Now, I wasn't here, um, but um, uh, it, you know, the, in partnership with William and & Mary and uh, the Brafferton Legacy Group, which was uh, uh, joined by a number of uh, uh, community members here in town, um, CW Archaeology actually helped excavate uh, some of the site at the uh, Brafferton Indian School on the campus of William & Mary. Uh, in, in around 2010, right? Um, and that site uh, was sort of s special for us at the time because it, it was a, uh, in contradiction to what we had always sort of said, well, you know, all we see is English material culture. We don't know where natives were in historic Williamsburg, right? Um, we, we knew who lived there. We knew some of those objects that we should find, right? Um, and what was kind of interesting is the results of that excavation were a little bit mixed. Um, but one, do you, do you mind if I actually just show yeah. one object? I'm gonna skip through some of this, right? Um, one object that was found is a uh, leaded glass wine bottle, uh, excuse me, wine glass base that is clearly napped and some wine glass that is clearly napped. And that was found in uh, an 18th century context associated with the school, right? Now, this is both good and bad, right? Because in some sense, uh, I, I know personally when I talk about this, sometimes I fall into the trap of saying, oh, look, it's snapped, therefore we, we, we can now talk about you know, the, 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 the experience of the, the boys who were at the Brafferton, right? But, but I think one of the most fascinating parts about this, and the thing that I want to kind of pull away, and maybe, maybe it's useful for discussions later, is really you know, here at CW, what we're actually seeing with this object is the way you know, English material culture or colonial material culture we, we tend to essentialize it, right? But this highlights for us that no, this isn't the only story we can tell with it, right? We need to sort of recognize that there are broader audiences engaging with this material and, and really sort of use that as a vehicle to sort of broaden the stories we can tell in and throughout Williamsburg, I think. So that's kind of what our, our department and myself sort of charged, uh, hopefully working with Fallon, uh, or not more, more than hopefully, actually working with Fallon and, and sort of being able to bring what we have and, and, and bring that to the public through, through her expertise. Great, wonderful, yeah. thank you. Well, I think you guys can tell we are gonna be in for a really good conversation this afternoon. I should mention we're gonna hold time at the end for some Q&A, so if you have questions, 
sort of keep those in mind and we'll get to them uh, at the end of our conversation. And I think what you can tell from the opening there is that this is a topic that is incredibly complex. It's very nuanced. We see the change over time. We see the new lenses with which we begin looking at this history uh, and the ways that we think about it, particularly with the public. So one of the goals of the session is to think about how we center and restore indigenous voice, particularly with our audiences, for those of us who work in public spaces and the gaps that public history can fill. So the first question that I'm gonna ask you guys is, which we can sort of go back down the line, if that works for everybody. Um, I don't wanna be first. <laughs> okay, Helen doesn't wanna be first. Russell can be first. Um, <laughs> uh, so what challenges do you face, but what also are the opportunities that we have working in public history um, and conveying indigenous history? So challenges and opportunities working with the public. Ooh. Um, well, anybody who's worked with the public, whether it is a retail job or anything else, knows that working with the public definitely has challenges. <laughs> um, and that can be confrontational, aggressive, and in telling an indigenous story can be outright confrontational and racist. Um, being able to sort of turn those moments um, into educational moments and also being able to decipher between is this someone who's openly hostile or someone who just simply doesn't know any better because of our mm -hmm. educational system and Hollywood and 50 other things that paint indigenous people in different ways. Understanding which is which and then also being able to sort of reroute both of those into positive and educational um, encounters is definitely key. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I can say in my years um, at the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation um, on the civilian side of things this is the really the crux of what I've chosen to do um, for work as kind of a, a bit of a life's work kind of thing. Um, I was a field archaeologist for about a year or two. I held, you know, one or two other small jobs, but I've worked uh, originally as a volunteer and then a part-time and then a full-time and then the assistant supervisor of the site and now the acting supervisor of the site. Telling the indigenous story through public history is essentially a good bit of my purpose if you could put it that way. We all have a moment in our lives where we say sort of like Dave mentioned earlier something strikes your passion but also I, I kind of looked at it at least when I was a teenager my interest being what can I do out in the world that makes a difference that I can be satisfied with when I make it to the ripe old age of 80, 90 or whatever versus what what I do simply to make money because young people are so conditioned we well, gotta you know make money and do this to be successful so anyways choosing sort of a career of meaning is what led me into this but it uh, it's a huge uh, it's a resource disparity if you look at just like I mentioned uh, living history sites are few and far between and the indigenous ones are incredibly few and far between and dwindling um, so there's a big resource disparity um, whether that is staffing, whether that is site, advertisement, I mean, it is across the board. So that is a big challenge out of the gate. Um, so you've got your public issues as far as the level of education and understanding that the public brings to you, trying to correct that. You've got resource disparity in-house across the board. Um, I mean, it's not hard to see. If you go to Colonial Williamsburg, and this isn't to pick on Colonial Williamsburg by any means. Um, our lovely host. Our it's in the title, it's Colonial Williamsburg. I've lived in this area for a while and I didn't even know that the American Indian encampment existed, much less how to find it. And I knew people who worked there. Um, if you go to, to pick on the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, it is called the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. The sign says, Living History Museum and Ships. And ships. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't forget the um, ships. <laughs> uh, and there are, you know, a whole host of, of issues. So it's definitely dripping with challenges. As far as the opportunities, um, it's a story that increasingly people are more interested in. There is that opportunity. Um, and there's a great opportunity now um, in our time to step beyond a lot of the issues of the past and above all to involve the native community, whether that is someone in a Virginia tribe or someone in another tribe, but with such a small number of sites and so little living history presence on the indigenous side, uh, involving the community. 
if that is the Nansman Indian Nation just across the river, if that is an interpreter from a tribe way up north who wants to tell an indigenous story here, the community has got to be more involved. That is a huge opportunity um, that just has to be taken advantage of. And we're definitely making big strides in that now. Um, and I feel like it's key to say that there are those of us from, uh, from tribes a little further out, there are not indigenous staff, there are Virginia tribal community members who are all involved in this from the museum side of things. But the real credit in sort of seizing on that opportunity as much as we have so far has to go to the community because a lot of challenges in the past in telling the story is that museums, these included and others and other institutions were exploiting indigenous people, not utilizing that relationship in a positive way. So those slides we may go back to at some point, oh, those are Rappahannock tribal members who yeah. The Those are Rappahannock tribal members who are out telling their own story in a way through the sort of more broader context of the Powhatan chiefdom. But you can read through a lot of the language that's actually used in here, and it is everything from off base to downright insulting and racist. So overcoming a lot of the way that um, that relationship between indigenous people and educational institutions has run um, is definitely a challenge, but it's also certainly an opportunity. Yeah, so, great. Yeah. Thank you. Is there something that the rest of the panelists want to build on here in terms of thinking about challenge and opportunity? I think that was a really good uh, lay of landscape there, Russell. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for breaking the ice. <laughs> <I'll>, uh, <laughs> now that you've broken the ice. Um, yeah, challenge is an opportunity. So challenge is one is, is honestly for a native person that works in a museum, there is an inherent level of your own historical trauma that you're made to face in interactions with the public, not only with the public, but interactions with your own staff and the institution that you work at. And, that, and that's part of why we've had such an issue with recruitment and also retention is because of this long history of exploitation by museums, um, archaeologists, anthropologists, historians, communities don't seem to forget that. Even though we've done a better job in recent years of that, it's hard to erase that or scrub that from the memories of community members. Um, and so they're still rightfully very mistrustful of these institutions. And so to be a Native person that works inside of one of these institutions, you interface not only your own mistrust of the institution, um, but looking like a traitor to your community for working for the enemy. <laughs> and then you deal with a little bit of your own uh, historical trauma kind of being tapped into every time the public asks you something that usually is their own curious question. Because this is what I tell interpreters when we train them is that when you get a question that triggers you and makes you, you feel like you want to run and hide or cry or be angry at that person, it's usually not them trying to be belligerent at you. It's them, they wouldn't ask you if they weren't actually interested. But we don't teach things in K through 12 or in our media or in society. We're not raised with the vocabulary to ask these things sensitively because we were not, you, you all were not given. I'm looking around, nobody in here is under the age of 18 or 16 in this room. None of you were given the proper in, in, uh, in education to have these conversations in a, in a sensitive way. And so we do get questions. Um, and you hear stuff at Jamestown all the time about, uh, is the Indian going to scalp me? Um, he's got to deal with that. Um, I, you know, we, just, we, we deal with very um, insensitive sounding questions, but I, ha I have to take a beat. I have to swallow my own, my own you know, reaction in that moment, and then I have to say, this person wouldn't ask if they didn't really want to know. And so then I have to help them pull apart the bias of their own question and where that came from in a sensitive way to them, because I need to then not re-trigger something that they feel sensitively ignorant about. Because sometimes people are going out on a, on a limb asking us these questions, and that comes out in a funny way, or they make a joke that's insensitive, because humor is their way of dealing with that uncomfortable moment. Um, so that's definitely a challenge, and it's a challenge for us in, in recruiting, because these communities here don't forget what these museums um, kind of how they've handled interactions with them in the past. Even the American Indian Initiative here at Colonial Williamsburg is only about 20 years old. And in those 20 years, it has built great things, had huge programs, and then fallen 
flat and disappeared again, and then built back up and then disappeared again. Um, and in those multiple trials and errors and going through different people managing the initiative, um, it has done different things that different communities didn't like. And so sometimes it's hard for us even to say like, hey, I know I wasn't here 15 years ago when, when the institution had this interaction with you, but will you please come back and work with us again? You know, so that's them um, having to say to their own community, yes, I'm willing to work with Colonial Williamsburg again, even though we know that they kind of did us wrong last time. So that's, I put myself in the firing line by doing that. Um, you know, growing up here, I grew up here in uh, Virginia, despite not being from a Virginia tribe, um, military, et cetera, long story. Um, I grew up right here in York County with people telling me all the time um, or asking me all the time, hey, which one of your parents is black? Hey, which are you? What are you? Hey, you look really exotic, but I can't quite place it. What's your exoticness about? So I, all the time people were giving me different varieties of the question, why don't you look white? But then when I answered with, I think what you might be seeing, the copper skin tone, I was much darker as a kid, the copper skin tone thing might be like my native ancestry that you're seeing, and then I would immediately get told, oh, sweetie, like you, you must be confused. Native people don't exist here anymore. You know, like bubbling in our scantrons for the SOL tests in school, you know, if I bubbled in American Indian slash Alaska Native slash Pacific Islander, which was the bubble at the time, um, I s twice got it back where my teacher had erased the bubble and bubbled in something else that they thought instead. And I was too young and had not been trained to have the vocabulary to have that conversation. Um, but the one time that I do remember asking, you know, okay, so then why is there a bubble here? Why is my bubble here if my people aren't here anymore? The, oh, that's for people who live like way out west and their, their military families like transplanted them here. Right. There, there haven't been native people on the eastern seaboard for ages. Yeah, the sense that indigenous history only happens in one place. Yes. Or at least on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains, or the other side of the Rockies. Or, yeah. Yeah, that like in this place that we are in, indigenous history. And they're like, ain't that sad? They're right. just, they just haven't been here for a while. You know, so having to deal with that growing up here and then working at a museum where often, um, because we are not all copper skinned and raven haired with long straight hair down to my ankles anymore, like I, you know, we get flack for that. We also have Afro-Indigenous interpreters here at CW who basically are hidden in plain sight because they work with our black programs and you would never know and that's because of the public facing um, thing that they have had to deal with that um, you know, we're trying to bring out some Afro-Indigenous program, but that's new for CW because of that racism that we face. So I think in addressing your opportunities going forward, we have a huge opportunity as a living history museum that speaks directly to the public to do something that I, as a professional historian and scholar, it takes like 20 years to crack through into the public mindset. I can, as a public historian at a site, reach the public on a daily basis and change their hearts and minds and help re-educate. Um, we also work with Teachers Institute, which is very helpful because mm -hmm. they have a direct line to the K through 12 teachers um, and they come here and we get to blow their minds every summer, which is really fun for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have a huge opportunity to fill mm -hmm. gaps in the narrative um, for, J for Jamestown's site to really fill a, a gap in indigenous perspective. You know, there's a lot, a lot of people have read a lot of the Jamestown records, but not necessarily from an indigenous lens. And even at that, well, what's the Virginia indigenous perspective? Because not, we're not a monolith. There are 574 federally recognized tribes. There's another 400 state recognized tribes under, on top of that. I've just reached almost the number 1,000 right there of different tribal entities in the United States. <laughs> That's a lot of people. And so as an indigenous historian, a lot of times people expect me to be an expert in all 1,000 of those tribes. Mm -hmm. And uh, their, their material culture, their social history, their political history, their economic history, like I'm supposed to run the gamut. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another challenge we face as well. And when you stretch beyond that number, um, the whole system of recognition is a whole nother yeah. challenge because mm -hmm. you can say, well, we have all these tribes and, and people and families and all who are not recognized as being indigenous. Um, and there's, you know, it's a big struggle in the community across the country, but, um, you know, the Virginia tribes, many of them gained state recognition in the 80s and federal recognition a handful of years ago. They didn't become indigenous overnight. So to exclude people based on that is also its own challenge. But yeah, there's a far greater number than you would imagine. And there are people in Virginia, just as a small challenge that I speak to who are far from young, who will tell me, well, I didn't know there were any native people in Virginia. And they live an hour from one of the oldest reservations in the country, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. yeah. So there's definitely a lot of perceptions and challenges to, that the audiences bring with it, with visitors bring when they come to us, obviously. 
So for the work that you all do in archaeology, so Dave and Sean, what what are the opportunities and challenges that you see? You also work with the public to one degree, but very different than the living history sense. What are the challenges and opportunities in terms of indigenous voice there in the spaces you work in? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, we, we as, as sort of was talked about, yeah, I mean, sometimes in our history in archaeology, anthropology is somewhat problematic. So I do think that is, that is both a challenge and an opportunity, right, to sort of like attempt. And that is something that the field is, uh, writ large, is attempting to sort of reorient itself, uh, uh, you know, in that, in that regard. I do, thinking more towards sort of this public museum aspect, I mean, I think one thing, and I'll, I'll just sort of speak, uh, and Dave, I mean, I think you have, uh, you know, I, I'm the curator, so I'm inside most of the time, um, <laughs> right? I, 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 I write some text and I, I pick out objects. Um, to that end, though, I mean, I think one opportunity that we have, and write this sort of notion about sort of saying, let's not use material culture as a way to sort of silence the stories or, or essentialize the stories we're telling is that Let's be frank. Archaeology is pretty freaking cool. Most most <laughs> people, yeah, the publics, right? It is a it is a vehicle in which a lot of people want to engage with, right? Um, or at least uh, maybe I've, maybe I've got to buy a sample, right? We got people coming to, to talk to us, but um, but it is a, a vehicle, right, to sort of uh, potentially put objects that can have more complicated narratives or can open up more complicated stories, uh, you know, out there for public consumption. So I do think that is one component, certainly from somebody who sort of serves more in that sort of curatorial sort of, yes, you know, front line, but certainly not front line in, that, in the sense that we sort of are, are speaking of here. But Dave, I know you guys, you, I mean, you literally lead tours um, you know, of, of Jamestown. I, I don't know what your sort of experience yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, the, the ultimately, <clears throat> the uh, archaeology is a reconciliation between what's in the ground, right, the truth, or an artifact, and uh, uh, history described by Jim Dietz in 1991 is uh, paraphrasing, rich, white, educated, deviant males, right? And so, um, yeah, that's the sort of. And feel free any slides to illustrate. Not not that point necessarily, but <laughs> just in general, just in general, you guys can use your slides. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, you know, it's it, that that's the difference between I think history and archaeology, and I think a lot of people sort of get that mixed up a little bit, even in our field, but, you know, at Jamestown, a lot of the artifacts are, are antithetical to the national narrative, in which uh, early on a binary was created. It has to be, right? You've got an, a, a domineering Western force, and two of my favorite authors are Edward Said and uh, Franz Fanon, and so, that, that's because there, and Edward Said was talking about the, what he called the Orient, Orientalism and the Occident, right? Why Napoleon would come into Egypt and with archeologists and architects and write a 12 volume set on, of Egypt, the history of Egypt. And one of the things is that, and we were talking about this backstage, is that history is what it is. We live in today's world, not 400 years ago, okay? And so it's sort of what the cards we've been dealt with Virginia Indian, uh, uh, sort of that reconciliation, right? The history. And so we constantly go to the documents because that's only the perspective we have is the written one from these deviant males. Um, but we, we're, at Jamestown, it's always an interplay between what's coming out of the ground and like, wait a minute, this is sand in our shorts. It doesn't really fit into your classic what I was taught in school and what others are. And so then that springboards directly into being on site and you have an eight-year-old coming up in her Pocahontas costume and Pocahontas is there and you can have that conversation, right? Like our, our largest numbers at Jamestown are when the Disney movie Pocahontas came out. Mm. Is that bad? Well, not if you're a nonprofit who depends on, right? That's your life. <laughs> but Thanks, is it an opportunity to pivot and, and talk about contentious landscapes? Absolutely, right? You can have to a degree. So on site, I engage with people at different levels if they're willing to have that conversation. Uh, one of our interns, when uh, she was a very demure person, and she was leaving us. She was a, a, a First Peoples uh, intern, 
And my senior staff archaeologist, Sean Roma, said, hey, do you want to have an exit sort of interview on how we're interpreting native space? I expected, yep, it's great, it's fine. She showed up with four pages kind of thing. It's like, the first thing she said was Pocahontas was sex trafficked. I want you to understand that. And that's absolutely 100% true. Can we lead with that? Well, no. But can we, right, can you work your way to a concept of a contentious landscape and the land that we live and work on is Paspahe? Well, yes, let's acknowledge that right now. But I, I want to say that it is always for people, practitioners, maybe is the right word, we're skating between the, that deviant narrative and the public and the, and the archaeology, certainly for us. And that's a really weird interstitial place to be, I think, ultimately, that, yes, it is cool. Um, because it, it, you are finding objects that, in that interstitial space, that I will show you guys today that make you go, oh, wow, that's crazy. You know, that's the, the things that are going on. You and that's the importance of archaeology. You can show them now. You can show them. Um, do you want I mean, me to? I mean, you can't say that, and then I'll tell you later. <laughs> Okay, so when, when the project was first started, I want you guys to understand, so, you know, there was no fort to be found. It was washed away. And for two years, the Park Service continued to give tours going by you saying, well, Jamestown is in the water. And then as time went on, we started finding not only the fort and the, the graves and the ditches and the wells and the buildings and things like that, but it became this actual uh, this treasure trove of a, what we call a synchronic period seven to ten right sixteen seven to ten because that's when the anglo-powhatan war starts and so you don't really have this kind of data and, and i'll show you guys some of that now another thing is the deep wells pits and cellars that were excavated by the colonists weren't that's not something virginia indians did like on the paspahe things are above ground in the tidewater of Virginia. It's wet. You dig a hole, it fills with water, right? So 16 foot deep John Smith's well excavated in the winter of 1689 and backfilled in the starving time winter. And, the, and shortly thereafter in 10 is a democracy of deposition. I used that in a paper recently and the editor was like, that's an interesting term. But they don't sort trash, guys. And so wells, when they become unused, there's no magic elves to pick up your trash on Friday, right? So everything goes in here. And so it's a unique opportunity. And I'm telling you, it's, a, it's an incredible collection. Now, this, many of these things are interpreted in our museum in, a, in an exhibit called The World of Pocahontas. Now, that doesn't really sit with us well. But the way that that exhibit came about was our current president was the vice president over here, Colonel Williamsburg, and we entered into a management agreement and we sat at a table and he said, okay, I'm gonna write the history and you guys find the artifacts that match. Which I, well, I, I actually love that, to have that discussion, right? And it's, so then it's like, well, wait a minute, we don't do that, right, at Jamestown. The museum, the artifacts tell the story, right? And that's principally Bly Straub, Dr. Bly Straub, who, um, I think is here tonight, right? Is that you, Bly? It's no, blinding, it's blinding me. So anyways, the, um, the artifacts tell the story, and so what is that story that we're telling? And so for us, a lot of these are build question, right? So again, why? Why are, you know, and so we have a lot of what would be termed traditional tools. For archaeologists, they span centuries, like these celts aren't traditionally found like on the Paspahe village. Right, but they're found and clearly used at James Fort. Ceramics, nutting stones. I grew up in the mountains and we don't have nutting uh, uh, stones down here that much because of quartz and quartzite. But if you're walking the farm field and you're pick, as you're baling hay and you pick up a rock and throw it against a tree, many of those are nutting stones. And so, you know, it's things like this over here that you see. Now these are artifacts out of the, that uh, John Smith well and the second well of 1611. That's Virginia Indian corn. That's Southern Dent and Northern Flint. So Northern Flint is sort of like popcorn you have today. It's very dry. And when the frost comes early, which should be in the next few weeks for us, if it, if it freezes, the corn will rot on you, right? And Southern Dent is it dries, it dents in. 
The dent is 32 rows generally, and the flint is about 16 or so. That down, down. Squash and gourd, this is an ext extinct eastern elk fleshing tool. So it's got a comb on the bottom, which is very hard to see here, and, and the top has been rounded because you hold it in your hand and you're, you're taking the fat off the hide so it doesn't, doesn't go rancid. And then these are Gukinzia demissa, demissa shell beads, ribbed mussel shell. Now, should I keep going? I'm, yep. Sure, go do this I'm, I'm almost we'll do the next so, question. So this is a, one of my favorite artifacts it, uh, with those nutting stones. The, this is punch-dressed Roman sandstone, Kentish ragstone. This was taken out of the Thames as ballast or out of a street, likely, and converted into a tool here on site. And it, it, it's to the point, guys, of getting away from the word prehistory and thinking of the two cultures here in North America and in Europe as being a continuum, right? Because things get swept up in this whole entire colonial story. Here's one of the punch-dressed Roman sandstones sandstone out of the uh, uh, structure 1610. So the, the beads I get asked a lot about, and it's one of my favorites, the, the stone drill was found uh, many adjacent to these. And the question is, why would you do this if you had, there was a jeweler with the early settlement that you could use a nail, but using micro CT, they're clearly drilled with this, this, this stone tool. And so you, that's, a, that's the uh, antithetical position to like guns, germs, and steel, right? Like why is this going on at a, at a European site? And then when we were working on our exhibit, which I'll show in a second, um, we remembered this woodcut from Theodore de Bry, and in the background, Ralph Hamer was asking for Pocahontas' sister's hand in marriage for uh, Sir Thomas Dale and you can see him bending over, and the bride price for a Powhatan woman is an arm's length of beads, and it's a Gukinzia demissa, it's shell beads, not long tubular, uh, you know, other kinds of beads. It's those specific beads. And the point is, not only is this rubbing the history cat the wrong way, but who's living in whose space, right? Because as archeologists and anthropologists, and even you today as people, when you're single, you have your things, and when you have a partner, you have our things. And so go home and open the cabinet and try to pick out your coffee cup, your wife's, your partner's, whatever. That's archeologists, right? We're trying to figure out the trajectory, whatever this is, in a, a larger narrative. Um, so that, that uh, might be interesting. Yeah, there. well, so I think that's a, actually a really good point. When we think about narrative and dominant narratives and the ways that each of your disciplines and practice can help us fill that dominant narrative in a way where there have been gaps historically. Um, sometimes that is, I've seen in our work at Jamestown, people often say, well, that's not documented, right? Like, well, we only have English sources, so we are going to tell you the, the indigenous story through an English lens because that's what we wrote down and we value English sources, right? Is the short story of, of how that goes. Um, and something that we are trying to actively um, address and, and redress in that space. So how do you use your work to try and repair, correct, fill that narrative in terms of indigenous voice? Uh, so I'll start with some of uh, the work I chose to do in scholarship when I went to school and I chose my topic and I knew I was gonna write a thesis and um, I thought, you know, geez, it's just so unfair that one, when I look on Wikipedia, I never totally get the right information on our people. And even to read into it, I had to read so many books to understand what was correct and what was not correct because they all contradicted each other, not in a scholarship way, in the way that we debate as scholars, they literally contradicted each other's points. And I was like, well, what is the history of our people? Um, and so I also got kind of angry that I didn't see enough of our perspective. Like our folks are heavily documented in what's called the Jesuit relations, which is like 73 volumes that were written across like over a hundred years of time. Um, and the Jesuits from that time period don't sound like super nice about our folks, just to be frank. Um, and so I <laughs> had to dig through a lot of my own personal uh, um, feelings about that. And then in deciding how to, to construct my project, I thought, you know, how can I address this? How can I address this gap in voice? 
um, that exists in this history. Um, and to do that, I wanted to tap into some of our oral history, but I also wanted to do it, when I first said oral history to my advisors, like they were scared. Um, because this, the, it's a thing where oral history is still treated as myth by some people because they don't understand that there's layers of oral history and how the community checks back on itself and accounts for some of that, that there are things that we know to be myths that we tell purposefully as myths. And there are other things that are oral history that is actually just like documented history. It's been regurgitated the same way by historians you know, down the, the line who were actively being given that role for their community. Um, so I thought, OK, if, if oral history is too scary, what if I take the Western concept of oral history? You know, so if you're familiar with like the WPA narratives mm -hmm. or the Holocaust uh, interviews that were done with Holocaust survivors, that is, that is a form of oral history that we as Western trained historians recognize as valid. And so I went to my community elders and tried and got you know, interviews with them about the topic that I was interested in to get sort of our perspective on that. So I think filling in the methodology, um, sometimes you just have to be really clever and circumnavigate. You have to have somebody who understands what the academy is asking, but also understands what the community's needs are. And it takes kind of a special person to be able to bridge that gap and communicate between those two things. Um, Archaeology is a great way of, of filling that gap. Um, you know, anybody out there who's an eth ethno historian, you know that we utilize a lot of anthropological methods. You know, and that's something that's been happening for over 50 years. That's not new information, but it's new when you're when you're trying to look at it from more of a indigenous perspective. Um, there's things that I look at with language too. Learning parts of our language opened me up in a way that when I reread the sources, you know, the Jesuits trying to document our language, I said, oh. That's probably not what they thought it meant. But you don't know that until you know more of the, of the language, which takes collaboration with an immense amount of scholars. I had to know in my personal sphere linguists who were specialists in this, who wanted to take their time honestly for free to talk to a student about it. Um, so that's, I think, some of the gaps. You know, and we're, we're trying to address that too here at CW and, and sort of redesign our methodology for that reason, because it's been these museums have kind of been slow, I think, to adapt at times in terms of what we accept as accepted methodology. Yeah, um, I feel like there's three kind of key ones that sort of run counter to this kind of fixing this, I guess, this issue um, is there are unfortunately a lot of gaps in the written record of the English um, and other, you know, colonial invading forces. Um, but oftentimes the little important pieces of indigenous history that are in those pages is just flat out not understood or it's overlooked or it's not revisited. If you aren't looking for it, you don't know anything about it and you don't care, you're not going to find it and you're not going to bring it to light. So it exists um, not nearly as much as we wish. Um, you have to read it kind of against the grain as people like to say with an indigenous lens, you can frame it a bunch of different ways, but the written record can be more useful to indigenous history. It just has to actually be sifted through for the little bits of value and information that it has. Um, also counter to that, uh, the communities themselves, um, if they're willing to work um, sort of overcoming the mistreatment and exploitation they faced specifically with educational institutions, um, the communities outside of specific oral histories about, you know, um, let's say more cultural things, but some of the communities and, you know, it's not mine to share, so I'm going to leave this kind of vague. They know when and where things occurred, things that archaeologists and historians and, you know, the world at large is like, oh, we wish we knew where this happened or where so-and-so lived. There are communities out there who know, oh, well, yeah, so-and-so lived over there and this tribe that's not with us anymore, you know, they were over here and then they intermarried. Um, involving the community, and I'm going to repeat this a whole bunch of times, involving the community. What was that? Involving <laughs> the community, oh, there's the back. but also understanding <laughs> that they are not going to tell you everything because of what they have been through. I was on a kayak tour of a fabulous little stretch of river not that long ago. And some guy really confidently said to me, well, the river is named this because of so-and-so to do with John Smith and this and that. And I leaned to the other guy and I said, that's not true. <laughs> she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you've got this is a possible reason, this is a possible reason. And then people I know in this tribe say, this is really the reason. And she looked at me and she said, well, I wish they would tell us these things and quit keeping them to themselves. And I looked at her 
And I said, I can't imagine why they would be distrusting of outsiders. <laughs> I said, but you know, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let some of my friends know they should share this information with you, you know. Um, but she just felt so indignant about, well, how dare they not tell us why this river is called so? Um, would you? Um, and then uh, another thing that really ties heavily into my work, um, besides digging through the historical record and working with the community, is a term that y'all may not be all that fond of, but I'm probably going to mention it a couple of times, uh, and I want to clear up a little bit of what it means, experimental archaeology. Experimental archaeology, I have seen uh, misquoted and used and abused, but it has great... Um, it has great ability to correct and fill in some of this indigenous historical narrative because as an archaeologist um, or historian, you can pull up a line of text or an artifact in the ground and you have face value. You can think about it, you can analyze it all you want, but in working in living history um, in a really deep sense for a long time, um, a lot of those artifacts that were displayed on the screen earlier are things that I'm familiar with from making them and using them. So you can learn about, well, why was the pottery done this way? Well, the center version we did cracked and broke when we cooked with it over fire. Well, why were the arrow points so small? Well, hunting with traditional equipment, I can tell you, um, I don't need a big heavy arrowhead because it's not gonna go that far. So there's so many practical bits of indigenous science that write the way the historical archeological record is, why it exists that way, that you just don't, you can't grasp fully if you're not physically doing it. You know, I can say, <laughs> um, I, can, I can answer, well, um, I had someone um, whose opinion I respect, a historian say, well, you're using that ax, you know, a stone ax for cutting wood and all. I've always assumed that they were, you know, weapons and showpieces and all. And I said, holding it. I said, this thing I've been using for five years now. It's been through a couple of canoe builds. I split firewood with it just, Cuts trees with it. <laughs> just, just to show it off. There's so much value in experimental archaeology, but it has to be rigorously done. If someone goes out and they craft a indigenous style cook pot or an indigenous style archery set and it doesn't work, because you tried it one time and well, clearly this didn't work or it wasn't used for that because I couldn't make it work, is not by any means acceptable. But there have been books and articles and theories published on that for a long time. Well, I made this type of arrow from this in the record and it didn't fly all that well, so you know, it was probably just for this and that. Experimental archeology span is incredibly useful in filling this in, but it has to be realistic you are not in one or two or a dozen attempts going to recreate something that people pioneered and refined over thousands of years. If you can't make A, B, or C work in this way, um, it's probably more to do with your lack of skill and verse in this subject. That doesn't mean the indigenous people who created something similar but refined over thousands of years. Your, your work has to be to a high level because what they were doing was to a high level. These people that we're talking about in the past, you know, the woman likely making that cook pot, the man crafting and using that uh, selt for an axe or other things or that arrow point, their lives and their family's lives were intimately tied to these. These people were not CPAs and bus drivers and CEOs and all. These were things they learned from their family who learned it from their family going a long ways back. So yeah. reading against the grain, Talking to the community and experimental archaeology, I think, are three useful things to kind of fill that in. Yeah. I can tell you from working agriculture for three hours in a wrap skirt, the ancestors were probably not doing agriculture in the wrap skirts. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that actually, Russell just said, sort of comes back to that story, or not story, but that, that statement about knowledge, right? That what you're talking about, too, is sort of through experimental and experimental archaeology, at least in my book, Dave, is not a dirty word. Don't worry, you're good. <laughs> uh, analogy is inherently built into some of those sort of like trying to figure out how does material culture work, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, I th but I think that, that point that you're sort of bringing up about experimental archaeology is a way to sort of attempt to get or capture knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. that, it, that is not, uh, may not be available to a particular person. But I, but I think actually, and I'm, I'm sorry to sort of lead into a sort of dorky, uh, a sphere. We're all but, here for dorky. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay. But I mean, actually, so you know, again, not to not to not to cite another person to read or anything, but there's actually a woman 
uh, actually she's a philosopher of science, but her name's Allison Wiley, and she, she actually writes about this, this sort of, you know, right, some of the, some of the um, conflict between archaeology and native communities is that, that notion of, right, sort of archaeology is telling the objective is truth, right? Um, and I think sort of what you're speaking to is really sort of the interesting point that she sort of brings up and sort of say, well, if you really want to be objective, you need to wind as many different knowledge bases together so that you can actually, right, so that arrow didn't fly. It's not because the arrow was bad or it didn't do this, it's because you stunk, right? <laughs> you know, like you're saying. And that, that's, I think, sort of, that's an important point. Maybe, maybe that's another opportunity, right, sort of where some of the sort of academic highfalutin, um, you know, uh, let's talk about uh, objectivism and relativism and all that sort of stuff, but, but where it actually does come down to meet, meet um, actual public interaction, actual research, actual things like that. So I think that's actually, that, that was a great, a great summary. I love, like I said, you'll never, I will never be upset with experimental archaeology for that very reason. That's great. I mean, it's, it's what we do with these living history sites is all exarch, it's all experimental yeah. archaeology, and that's why it's important to keep these sites funded to do what we do seven days a week, because as Russell will probably tell you about archery just in general, but any of these topics, even the 40-hour work week that we have to do them within, we're never going to get as much experience doing that as the ancestors who were actually doing those. And so it's just not quite possible for us to gain the same expert level skill that they had. And so we try to get close. But imagine if we were a site that only ran on the weekends. We just wouldn't be able to get that same level of expertness. <laughs> yeah, in, in kind of a, a bit of a clash with a curator in the past, I, I was instructed in front of the public that I was incorrect. Um, very aggressively about my interpretation of dugout canoes, and I'll keep this short, but it, what it boiled down to, aside from having read more on the subject, um, my position um, was, that's great, but have you ever made and used a dugout canoe? If you've read three lines about one in a book, or you've read three books about one, I can tell you, you learn a whole lot making and using the thing. It doesn't mean that you're on the level of the people who used to do it, because every time I make and put out a new dugout canoe, I go, man, I know I'm not as good as the people who are doing this originally. I know there's a way to make it a little better, but there is definitely a difference between, well, I read about this thing one time and I've done the thing from start to finish because there's a lot of little things you will not learn otherwise. So Dave, is there anything you want to add in this space of ways that we sort of help fill the narrative? Yeah, I mean, so we, we experimental archaeology is actually very well accepted. I mean, a lot of our buildings are, are, are mud and stud, the, you know, the first house of the colonists, the lo sort of longhouse, medieval longhouse, was experimental archaeology. We're trying to figure out what's in the ground and what it would look like above, right? It's that, that sort of, that perception. I think to the point that, it, and it's more like in experimental interpretation, though, right? Like it's not archaeology. Mm -hmm. right? the, the the object was in archaeology, but I often refer to myself as a dirt surgeon because I'm not. I'm you know, it's like I'm out there to recover the things in the manner, and the academic interpretation has only come later in my life when I w could afford to go back to graduate school, my kids were eat, feeding themselves kind of thing. <laughs> so I think that, you know, from, I think that was important because I've been digging my whole life. And so just like you've been working on that one thing and repeatedly over and over, you get to the point of la difference, right? Like, so when we're out there on site, like, it, wait, this is different from what you've seen somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where we get into sort of the deep or, or what they might call the serious business or the serious game, right? Like what, you know, Jamestown, you might call it an ethnogenesis of a type, right? Because you've got some, there's some serious things coming out of, of that moment, that event horizon. And I think others may study the back end of the empire, if you want to call it that, right? Like after there's it, there, it's total dominance and, and there's no voice. Um, and the, and the archaeology does have that restorative voice. Those, you know, the time when first peoples were in charge, right? And, the, and they're, they're dominating that narrative and therefore it shows up in the archaeology. And, and so that, I would say that's the only thing that we can sort of bring to the table is getting out of the ground. Now the interpretation, yeah, just like the failed experiment in, uh, that you might do 
with the artifact, you have to keep going back to it and going back to it. And I'm very hopeful of the future, right? Because I'm not dumb enough to know that I'm only a blip on the map at Jamestown and the kids, the next generation, have to pick up the torch and history is malleable, right? Like their interpretation of the past, well, they'll bring to the table maybe a different perspective. And that's what's so neat, right? Like t to the point of we as ourselves and that canoe, right? You're just constantly working at it and trying to get better and build that in interpretation. It's analogous or metaphorical to that um, in, in, in my, you know, sort of my perspective. And I think it does help. Are we ever gonna restore? No, um, fully. Can we get to some point where we acknowledge that? Yes, yes, right. So that's actually a great segue, looking at time. We're gonna open up to Q&A here shortly, but I'm going to ask a question that you can each answer, building off of that, Dave, which is, when we talk about restoring indigenous voice in early American museums, in your opinion, what would that successfully look like to restore indigenous voice? And I know we only have, you know, like maybe right. five minutes before we open up, but so it's a loaded question. To hear. And I will <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> okay, as, as our back. So this is uh, our, our Archaearium, our Archaeological Museum, and uh, leading up to the, to the uh, anniversary or the commemoration of John Rolfe and Pocahontas being married at, at Jamestown, we were asked to put this exhibit together. And so a lot of the things we just talked about were, were woven into that, but in a uh, not an overt way, right? So when you enter the gallery, you don't realize it, but you've just been through a bunch of squares, right? And so Native people, First Peoples often envision themselves as round. The earth is round, you know? Um, and we kept seeing that again with maps, you know, down in, in South Carolina, there's circles drawn and the English are drawn as squares. And so- They are. We, yeah, we thought about that, and that part of the gallery is round, and so we were thinking about cosmology, and then as you go through it, we don't say contact. It's worlds of opportunity for both people to, to plug into each other, and they showed up knowing that, right? There's predication there. And then as you move through, we sort of flip the colonial lens. The images on the walls are women on the team. Um, back to the previous slide, um, Murray Outlaw and Jamie May. and. Then as you go through the center case, which to get a round case, by the way, was really expensive. Yeah, I think we only spent about a hundred and some thousand on the whole exhibit. But the center case reifies the external. And as you go around, there's a section called creating a third space and a moment in time. And then it ends, you, you go out uh, with a, uh, essentially a panel that was, we're, we're still here, right? Like, our colleagues are getting PhDs in anthropology, archaeology at William and Mary. There's right. There's 1901 interpretations. Right. There's there's interns, indigenous interns working at Jamestown. People like Jeff Brown, who I worked with in archaeology for years, um, and interpreting on site, and and that leaves the public with an extra right into the rest of the, the museum and it's this is a very contentious thing guys to tear up a fifth of your museum and dedicate it to indigenous influence as an, a, a colleague at the time i said baby steps right and it always is iterative and baby steps and so that's how we have chosen at the time you know it's little things like in in the um in the labels as you go through we visited many other sites and they're all in English with the, you know, the tongue, native tongue in parentheses. And so we reverse that. And as you go through, we start replacing the words with Algonquian words so that you're not in your space and you have to go back. You're forced to go back and look at, wait, what was that word? And right. And so then that literally, that's how we were thinking of, I don't like using the word decolonizing. It's an anti-colonial or a restorative Maybe yes. is a better word. Right. I, I like that. Yeah, right. restorative. It's so. a, a good word. Do you um, want to? Yeah, I would say to keep it kind of short since we are running uh, up to our Q and A. Um, I think about this question a lot. What is the success mm -hmm. of really bringing the indigenous voice into public history look like? Um, and the two things that have always come to mind for me, um, sort of being at the helm of a, of an indigenous living history site, is inequality of resources. If I put in for or I need 
a full-time employee or I need funds for this or that or I want to, you know, get a hold of a tree to make a, you know, a realistic size dugout canoe and a quality of resources in the sense that if it's going to get answered for the Anglo-American site, that it gets answered for the indigenous site. If I walk through a museum at Jamestown or Yorktown or Williamsburg or wherever, I'm not looking at 10 small indigenous artifacts and, you know, half of a, of a house in the forest. And then I'm walking through a depiction of an English street scene and all of this stuff everywhere. I'm looking, what success looks like to me is an equality of telling that story. I'm looking at a sizable indigenous story. I'm looking at more native artifacts in there, more resources being spent on the indigenous side of things instead of, well, this is an English based uh, or Anglo-American museum. And then here's a couple scraps of indigenous culture thrown in here. So actually putting in the time and money and the resources to tell the indigenous story and not just making it an afterthought or a sideshow to the colonial um, story and then uh, involving the community, involving the community. When I'm gone from doing this job, my concern is that there are indigenous youth, hopefully from the Virginia tribes, but from any of the tribes across the country who are taking these jobs. That if I'm, you know, when I leave for whatever reason or I retire, that there is, you know, a whole slew of native youth filling these positions, looking to run this site, advocating for, and sort of being more involved in and sort of leading this effort. So that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> to me, it looks like, um, first and foremost, that eventually, for example, at this site, which is located in Virginia, that we're gonna have a bunch of Virginia indigenous people here who have been trained up at a high enough level in museum studies to be telling their story at an expert level. Um, we know, to Russell's point about um, us being kind of more every day, like from Thomas Jefferson's writings, we know that native people were on the streets of Williamsburg every single day. But how many of you have been to this site before? Did you ever see a native person? I mean, a lot of people don't even know we're there unless they're specifically looking for the encampment um, programming or they stumble upon one of our programs. Um, so, so to really get that visibility back to the accuracy of what it was in the era that that museum is representing and for that museum to have people on staff at the helm of that narrative who are representatives and descendants of that narrative um, would really be the goal, I think. Thank you. Sure. The only thing I'd add to that is uh, per personally from a curatorial perspective too, I think access is an important component mm -hmm. of that as well, right? Sort mm -hmm. of being able to provide materials so that people can uh, bring those interpretations to the public as well. So I, I, I would just sort of add that in from that side. I think that is an important part is the, the, the material behind the voice as well. Yeah, wonderful. Well, that was, I think, a great and inspiring session in terms of thinking about the ways that we can um, address gaps in narrative, begin to restore our voice, what we have potentially as hallmarks for success. Um, so we have about 15 minutes that we can open up to general questions. We have folks running mics. So raise your hand. Thank you for such a wonderful panel. Aside from learning from the community and involving the community, um, it seems archaeology is really important. Um, and I would like to know, with climate change, rising water levels, if we rely so much on archaeological evidence, how is climate change going to impact what we know about early indigenous communities? And how is that going to impact our efforts in museums and living history sites to accurately convey that history? And I think Dave could talk to you for hours about this, I won't. but I, won't. I promise it, because it is important. It's it's incredibly important. Yeah, I mean the the big story is and and uh, Kaylin Anderson, the son of the chief of the Nanzalans, came to us as an intern because of that uh, question. Yes, we're all w the water doesn't know boundaries, and so we are in the tidewater of Virginia, and so all of the what you're talking about, all sites that are good sites, right? To have a, a location, low lying, you know, very fertile land, flood plains, they're, they're going away and they are now. Um, Eastern shore is, is a nightmare. And so 
we volunteered to go on other sites, but Jamestown, we've lost 10 acres of 24 acres that we have. We have recently resurveyed. 10 acres is now underwater. And so what, is, you know, what does that look like for us? And, uh, and people say, well, why should we care? I think we know why today, right? And so you'll see us on the news hauling out swords out of wells and doing whatever it is we're doing, but we, we address all periods of history the same way. And so that's what we have to lose, guys, this once in a lifetime opportunity to look at it right now. And that kind of, it scares me a little bit, but the team is very good at recovering data in a, in a larger landscape perspective, geophysics and things like that. Um, but it's hard to hire even archeologists these days to find folks who want to go out in 110 degree weather, 100% humidity, and be digging holes that you're just gonna fill back in again, right? Like Sisyphus, so. Yeah, yep. that doesn't sound super appealing, but on very a, important work. On a very short sort of add on to that, my brief time um, you know, working in archeology span in the field, the first contract that we did was floating all over Eastern Virginia, all these different counties, ones that I was from and others I knew very well, and documenting all these sites that were known that, uh, mm-hmm. and putting them into a, a coastal or coastline uh, regression model to see which ones were gonna vanish first. And if you understand anything about um, indigenous cultures here, a huge number of them were right on the waterline because it was efficient. It's your means of travel, it's all these things to these communities here. And so these indigenous sites are incredibly threatened by loss of shoreline. Um, And like Dave said, it is far more aggressive than you imagine until you look at map overlays of counties in Eastern Virginia just shrinking away inside of a generation or two. And the disparity of putting in to actually investigate these indigenous sites is plain. I mean, the amount of work that's done at Jamestown, Jamestown, versus all of work that's done on indigenous sites is just plain and obvious. You know, there's so much emphasis put into the colonial sites, not always the funding or the availability to go after the indigenous sites. It's not the fault of the archeologists, it's where's the funding come from, the infrastructure, but it's a big problem. Right, Dave, how much of sure. Caspahay did you say was dug? The, uh, the, the initial site out there, the 18th fairway of the golf course and the clubhouse now, um, that's only one part of what I termed earlier as metropoli on all three sides, the Chickahominy on the other side, the other side of the James uh, or River Powhatan, like that, it's all, on, it's huge, yeah. right? And only one part's been looked at and the others are private land, you know, the, the gravel mine across, gone. Um, and so that's kind of what, that's why these sites are important, right? Like the ones where it's long-term and marginalized communities and peoples lived in marginalized areas that are underwater now. You see where this is going? And so that's gonna force us into areas that we might not often go. Jamestown is completely, I'm sorry, Jamestown is totally, you know, being looked over and poured over and visited and Paspahay is a golf course. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like that speaks volumes. And it's going to skew the data as well when we're trying, when we're asked these big questions to answer about indigenous populations. Um, if, if that land's being taken away and we don't have the opportunity to, to do further excavations on it future, um, I'm going to boil down incorrectly what's well, like a 400 page archaeological report, but it's going to still say like, oh, 16 people lived at Paspahe, and that's all we're ever going to know, you know, if we can't dig the rest of it. So the numbers are always going to be off for us if we don't get that opportunity. Thank you guys. There's a, someone has a mic here. <laughs> so this is a um, public history question for Fallon and Russell talking about going back to the community. Um, what advice do you have to begin to reach out to those communities, recognizing that, again, those communities are not a monolith um, and that there may have been broken trust, especially when there has been broken, broken trust in the past, to begin to try to reestablish those um, relationships to be able to continue to tell those stories. Do you want to start or? Yeah, if you've got a native friend handy, it's it's helpful to broker the deal and, and smooth the, the road a little bit. Um, if you've got a native person on staff, even if they're not from that tribe, that's going to look a little friendlier than someone who's non-native going in, just to be honest. Um, other than that, I forgot my second point actually, so you go ahead. Um, uh, one of the things I was going to say is explain your positionality. Um, if you are trying to reach out to community, this is who I am, this is where I come from, this is what I'm kind of seeking to do. Um, 
telling someone about yourself certainly helps them feel more open to be open with you um, and expect some friction. I remember very clearly being told years ago at a community event by a friend of mine from the Virginia tribes um, and she talked to me for a couple of minutes and she said, you need to quit that job. She said, I, don't, I know what you're doing and I really appreciate what you're doing for the community. She said, but that place, those museums, they use the community. She said, you, don't, you need to leave that job. Um, so expect friction. There, people remember. People remember, you know, what Jamestown and Williamsburg were like when they were kids. And uh, it uh, does not go away. Expect friction, take time, and, you know, explain kind of where you're coming from. And you know. That reminded me of my second point. Yes, so expect, expect friction. Go in knowing that nothing that they say to you is going to get your hackles up because they absolutely have a right to say that, no matter what it is because that is their own historical trauma response to that. And it's not personal to you. It is writ large against the Western Academy and everything associated with that museum, scholars, et cetera. Um, something that I always tell like Teachers Institute, because we meet people from all over the country who come here for that, um, is contact your local people. Always engage with your local people. That said, my big caveat is that not every tribe is the same size and has the same amount of resources. So if you reach out to them, do not be upset or mad at them in any way if they don't have anybody who can ever get back to you. If they never respond, that's probably because they lack the resources to staff a person who can get back to you. Or they lack the person who can gulp down whatever white guilt they're going to have to s struggle through to have that conversation with you, to, teach, to have a teaching moment with you. Um, it is not tribe's responsibility to educate you. It is, it is non-Native people's and our education system's responsibility to educate us on that. Um, and to do that work. It's, it's out the help of allies and those of us who are Native who are willing to do that work to really muck in. Um, so if you reach out to a tribe, they may or may not have a liaison person who is staffed who can give you that answer. So I, I always think that's like the right channel to try and pursue no matter what, but to know that if they don't have that, it's not their fault and not to be mad at them for it. Yeah, that's wonderful <laughs> advice. And we have one question down here and then one up there and then we're probably at time. You can, I can hear Hello? You. Oh, there oh, you go. Good. Um, I know you're thinking about retiring, maybe. <laughs> I don't One know. Um, you guys talk about um, the lack of uh, indigenous people coming and being a part of the experience and being invested in, um, you know, this area to, you know, promote that education, become ambassadors. What type of educational strategies are you exploring to get more Native Americans, more indigenous people involved uh, in this, in your efforts? There's one um, sort of change kind of sweeping across the country with a lot of changes that's helpful um, before I get into kind of our strategy, which is for generations, um, tribes in the East, indigenous people in the East faced very different challenges, especially depending on their level of recognition, where with heavy racial and segregation laws and all kinds of other things, a lot of families drifted away from their traditional culture, their traditional knowledge, or were forced out of it. Speaking your language was uh, something that could get you in trouble or, or hit in schools. I mean, I could go down the list of all these reasons why a lot of families don't hold as tightly to their identity over generations as a means of survival in, in the world that they're living in. But you're seeing a lot of people in my generation and younger people reversing that trend. Whereas their grandparents didn't want to talk about being indigenous sometimes, or they moved away from the reservation, or they quit speaking their language. A lot of young people in the community, in the indigenous communities, they want to be involved. They are reclaiming that sort of pride in who they are, and that's helpful because the young people are going to be helpful in sort of driving all this forward. And as far as strategies that like I'm personally involved in that are helping with this, um, for the last two years, we've been working with one of the Virginia tribes uh, in one of their summer camps that they do, um, which hosts kids from all over the Virginia tribal community um, and teaching traditional culture. So I will leave Jamestown, you know, two or three days out of the summer and go teach kids from five to 12 about something as simple as making a traditional arrow or someone might go and teach traditional pottery or this game or I might teach them archery or something like that. And it's a simple little thing to us, but it's huge to them. And the idea that some kid that I talked to, maybe you know, a, a, a Chickahominy kid that I worked with might, a couple years from now, when they're looking at what they want to do with their lives as adults, 
might say, wow, you know, I learned these things and I have this place down the road where I can go and teach my traditional culture and the truth of our history to the world at large. So working with the young people, um, working with the community is a broad thing, but it involves a lot of stuff, but hopefully that will yield fruit. And, you know, when I retire, you know, in a year or two, um, uh, you know, uh, someone, an indigenous person, a youth, somebody will be filling that role. I would consider that far more of a success than anything else. Keep showing up. The worst thing you can do if you want to engage the indigenous community is that you flew in, you helped, you worked with them when it was cool, and then the minute it was not cool or it cooled off, you left. Nobody likes that. Um, working with indigenous communities is not flirting, it is not dating. Um, it's really even more than a marriage. You married that tribe, you had kids with them, you now share blood. Your blood is mixed in the soil together. You have to have somebody at your organization that is in that deep that the indigenous community sees that that person that represents your organization cannot dig themselves out. That is reciprocity and that is responsibility to that community. If you don't have that person, maybe question whether it is right for you to actually be engaging the indigenous community at that point. Yeah, I think that, that term reciprocal is something that we've been talking a lot about as we build out an indigenous people's initiative at JYF is how do we make that reciprocal, um, which is a key part in building the relationships that will sustain you know, we talk about often museums pipelines um, that will, will help us build that as we move forward. Okay, we've got one last question in the back here. Um, hi, could you address the treatment of human remains? Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, I don't know if the museums hold any. Uh, if you have a repatriation program and um, the relationship with the tribes over the repatriation of human remains. So you guys want to? So okay, I, can, I will start. I'm not here as a panelist, but what I will start to say is that at JYF, we have begun the process of going through NAGPRA, um, for those of you in the audience that know Native American uh, great uh, patriation. And what's been interesting is we do not have human remains in our collection, but we are looking at objects that are important culturally that may be associated with funerary context. And that first piece of what NAGPRA is, is to identify what you have, determine where it is from, and then immediately begin the consultation process with those tribes. So to underscore everything that we've said today, it is ultimately built into community and consultation has been our sort of process at JYF. I don't know if you guys want to speak more about. I was just going to add to that too. That's sort of what I was getting at a little bit with access as well, right? Mm -hmm. As sort of these Absolutely. collections. Um, I mean, uh, Colonial Williamsburg is a private foundation, et cetera. Um, but so we do hold materials, right? And they can be behind closed doors. They have been behind closed doors in the past. Uh, we, we do not have human remains that uh, fall under any, that would sort of fit that, that the model of NAGPRA. But, uh, but we definitely have materials that are important to people culturally here. Mm -hmm. And like I said, sort of that, that the closed door mentality, I think, is, is hopefully maybe something that we can change to begin at uh, getting at some of this recipro reciprocality that, that mm -hmm. was just sort of uh, talked about. Um, and I think, you know, again, that, 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 that has to be part of uh, the, the sort of foundational level, the, the department level, the, uh, the, the long-term commitment level too, right? It doesn't matter, it's not helpful if someone can see something one time, mm -hmm. right? They, they have to be uh, available for, for community members, for, for folks to actually engage with and, and tell us the knowledge about if they choose to, right, and sort of contribute to. So. Yeah. Dave, do you want anything? I know you- Yeah, we don't, you we've never it. excavated uh, First Peoples' remains. Um, the collection, as you've seen, is hyper important to Virginia Indian communities. And so we had applied for a NAGPRA grant and didn't even get off the ground because we don't have, right? And so I said, wait a minute though, like this is, and it was like, well, you don't, Right, it, the, the letter of the law is this, and that's the problem with laws, right? Um, I would say overall. Now, uh, will we ever run into Virginia Indian remains? The answer is yes, as climate change pushes us into those marginalized areas, that's what I was hinting to. We're going to be forced into something, right? And so we, we have a, a strong relationship with the, with the tribes, I think, the Nanzamond, and that was through our Preservation Virginia had collections broadly, and so we had to go through the NAGPRA process. But I always, always uh, 
enjoy engaging with the Virginia Indian community, right? Because it's shared history. And if we're, ha we're engaging in this and we're not share putting it out there and being part of a panel like this today, I'm, I'm extremely honored to be here tonight because the voice, I think we quietly did this and then moved on to our next thing and it never got out. It was the first time I think we've ever, well, that's not true. Uh, Chief Gray and I talked about the challenges of this in London in 2017, the challenges of, you know, rubbing the history cat the wrong way. Um, but I, I think in the future, we're gonna have to go there. And um, it's gonna be probably unfortunate maybe uh, at the speed at which the climate is, you know, the water is taking the island and then we move, but we are good dirt surgeons. That's all I can say. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for attending. Yeah, please give a round of applause to our panelists. Wonderful. Thank you. And I believe we're supposed to go upstairs. Whitney's pointing upstairs. So you can join us for our reception upstairs. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you for being here this evening.